So as we talk about our educational case number one, <clears throat> we have a call where the son called uh, with breathing problems. Uh, the patient had been uh, doing pretty good in the afternoon, starting to breathe a little better, and then started to have some periods where she wasn't responding all the time. And so, but she then she would respond again, and her oxygen saturation, she had to put her oxygen back on, uh, and she was trying to... Uh, trying to make herself better by treating herself at home. And guys, we've all seen these COPDers and CHFers. What do they do? They stay at home as long as they possibly can, which makes our job what? Three times harder. Exactly. Because we're behind the eight ball then. Okay? So the crew walks in and they find the patient with LFD to the side. They started a NEB treatment uh, on a non-rebreather. So they've moved her from a cannula to a non-rebreather. The patient's a conscious alert and oriented. Uh, but... What is only able to talk in one to two word sentences? And uh, began to slump forward from time to time, but was set back up on her own. So we move on. Uh, the patient did have some rest, uh, the respiratory effort did not improve with moving to the unit. Uh, they gave Decadron another dual NAB, uh, moved her to a dual NAB now. Uh, patient appeared to become exhausted. And so you can see this progression where it was yes and no questions. Okay? So one of some of the things we can talk about is we talk about that need for CPAP and how quick can we get that CPAP on them versus do I have time to wait, do I have time not to wait. Now, you have CPAP in all of your units in the airway bag. So we have that inside the house at that time. Then, <clears throat> the suspense. The patient became unresponsive to any verbal commands. Uh, the patient would uh, retract from pain uh, and then uh, what, once began then slumped over uh, then at this time the patient is intubated okay so here's our vital signs now guys the crew did a great job by quickly getting entitled CO2 why is quickly entitled CO2 so good for us what <coughs> Baseline, okay, it's a great baseline, but at the same time it tells me what the waveform is, because guys, I'm going to hear that wheezing, but is that wheezing caused from my fluid level, or is it caused from my constriction? Okay, so I'm going to be able to see that by what my waveform is doing. As we progress, we're hypertensive, we're really working, uh, we're getting fatigued now. You can see end titles, I mean 91 on an end title. Wow, and that's just with her ventilating. That's not us ventilating her with positive pressure and forcing some of that out, which you'll see. <clears throat> we start to go, uh, we get a little bit further, and then we're sedated and paralyzed. So what I want to talk about is we had a CPAP, and you got to remember, and I, I put this slide together for a reason. We started at 106. Yeah, SATs are 85, but they're COPD and CH effort. A lot of these people may live at this. A lot of these people may live in the low 90s. Okay, so is 85 that bad for her? Uh, not so much, but when I put her on entitles and I saw she's 58 and then 91, what did that tell you? <clears throat> she's trapped out, okay? So she's got all that built up. She's trying to exhume that and not able to do that. So we put her on CPAP pretty late, 106 to 122, and then next thing you know, two minutes later, what are we doing? We're knocking her down and intubating her, okay? So we had about 16 minutes there of time we were trying other methods with you with her documenting talking one to two words per sentences. Okay? So one, uh, one to two words per breath. And so that tells me that, hey, maybe a little bit further behind, <coughs> would she have benefited? Could I have prevented that intubation? Maybe so, maybe not. Okay? But we want to give them that benefit. We want to get the drugs on board. We want to get the things on board that we've got in order to make it work quicker, okay? And the best way to do that is to force that air in. Educational case number two. <coughs> yeah, I'll mention a few things Go ahead. about that case. So I think you did a pretty good job kind of covering over the concerns on this case. You know, there was kind of that delay to thinking about CPAP, and we had several indicators. You know, we were getting little improvement in the way the patient looked. You know, what's the patient look like? We're not improving with just a regular duoneb. And also the end title CO2. It's going the wrong direction, right? 
So we've talked about CPAP, and I think most folks that I've just kind of talked to off record have really been impressed with the way you can really see someone turn around with it. You know, we've talked about the end of the day, this is not that we're wanting to minimize intubation, but we're wanting to minimize intubation because that's not the best choice for these patients. <coughs> Remember, when we're older and frail and have CHF, COPD, and we end up getting an intubation, we're to the ICU, 20% of them are going to end up with a healthcare-associated pneumonia, and probably 20% of them are going to die. So if we can keep them from buying that intubation, we save lives. And Bruce, can you kind of off the top of your head, what, what are some of the percentage of intubations we've decreased on the CPAP use? The year before we put this in place, we intubated about 100 to, I think it was about 104 was the final number. For CHF CHF patients. and COPD combined. Right, okay. okay. This last year, I think there was a total of four, if I remember right. There's four total intubations from CHF to COPD. And, and you know, 20% is probably even on the low side of saying how many of those 100 got healthcare associated pneumonia. You know, they'll say 20% get that. And, and again, 20% is pretty conservative on him, how many of those die from that. So, you know, that's probably 10. And, and that's the other side of the coin, too. When you have somebody that's to this point, and then you go, <clears throat> you knock them down, you go to intubate them, and you can't get them intubated. Then what happens? They end up crashing, going asystole, and then you're coding them. Yeah. That we see that quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, and that's another concern. But yeah, even assuming the intubation goes successful, we get to the hospital and get admitted. You know, a percentage of those patients die from healthcare-associated pneumonias in the ICU. And so I, I think we've improved that. On top of that, hospitals are being more receptive of our CPAP. <coughs> So they're moving quicker to say, hey, let's keep them on that because that's an easy screw-in machine. And then they'll keep them on it and they have a tendency because they don't have to have respiratory therapists there. They've already got them on the CPAP. So early CPAP is what we're stressing. Early CPAP is the key. Okay. Now, we had a crew just the other day, got there. We're gonna, they were playing was, they walked in, they could hear audible wheezing. But she's so far on a GCS scale... She was too far down and couldn't, so they didn't have any choice. They had to intubate her. Okay? Guys, you're still going to have those calls. There's nothing you can do about it. But if they're conscious alert and they're telling you, I'm working, I'm working, give them some help. Okay? And give them help quickly. That's what we want to push is that early CPAP. So any other comments on education? No, just a great point on mentation. You know, that's really pretty much the only contraindication to CPAP is you need to have a, you know, your mentation needs to be pretty close to normal. You can be a little droggy, but not much, because then you worry about just that pressure and vomiting and protecting the airway. So we need to have a, a pretty good mentation. Anesthesia uses swallow. They'll ask them, hey, can you swallow for me? And you know, it doesn't need to be that, you know, try. It needs to be a full swallow. That tells me I can keep my airway clear at that point. And that's where I'm probably pretty good for CPAP. Okay? So educational case number two. <clears throat> Uh, the patient has had increasing shortness of breath over the last week. Okay, that's your standard CHF and COPD. Here. It is. So we're already behind the eight ball. She says that uh, she's called the doctor. The doctor says, uh, let's get an appointment for the next morning. She says, she tells them, I can't last that long. Okay, uh, her legs are twice as big as she has, and she's quoted she's gained 17 pounds in the last week. Okay, I did that on a cruise. But that was because I was eating, not because of, yeah, well, you know, it happens. But this is at home, okay? She's probably not eating like she's on a cruise, but it tells me that we're fluid. So we talk about, now guys, you see this all the time. CHF, pulmonary edema, they have COPD with it, hypertension. Guys, it's hard to start diagnosing where am I at, okay? Is this my COPD today or is this my CHF today? At the end of the day, there's a little bit of a treatment difference. But we still can do CPAP on both of them. And so that's the thing we want to push. We want to get that done quickly. So we get there, and she's sitting up right on the bed with her feet elevated. She's alert and oriented times four, appears in severe respiratory distress. <clears throat> um, lower leg, she's four plus pitted. Um, the patient reports uh, relief of shortness of breath. Uh, this is about 26, 27 minutes later, okay? We'll talk about the later part here in just a minute. Patient was found sitting up in the bed once again with her feet elevated. Uh, you know, she's uh, four plus uh, in her lower. She does have audible wheezing from across the room. Now, we're going to talk about this orientation of wheezing here in a little bit. 
Um, but the patient, uh, once again, severes and uh, appears in severe respiratory distress. So we talk about her vital signs. She's hypertensive. And remember, with our CHF side, typically, remember we talked about in that educational portion, you're going to see that hypertension with it, okay? Because that heart is working very, very hard trying to perfuse things. And remember, the CHF side of it's not my respiratory side, it's my heart failure side. Um, but her stats are, you know, 95, once again, crew does a very good job getting to CPAP very, I'm sorry, getting to entitled CO2 very quickly. Uh, entitles, you know, not too bad. You're looking at them going 97, 35. You know, this one's kind of teetered. I mean, you know, is she that bad initially? Is she not that bad initially? Uh, but you, you've already documented severe respiratory stress, so you're telling me she's working very, very hard at this point. And then, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, here's where we have CPAP in. Look at the difference. 177 over 75, we're at 99, 25. So everything's pushing out very quickly. You see that change in that patient very quickly. So we did oxygen. She did it herself. And then we moved to oxygen, looks like we're supposed to, uh, at a more high concentration with a NEB. Uh, and we talk about the NEB here at this point. We get the cardiac monitor. We get a 12 lead. We get nitro. 1.2 milligrams. Okay? Very few times do I see giving high dose nitroglycerin. Is that fair to say, FTOs and seniors? <coughs> You're seeing nitro given, but we're very cautious with how much we're giving, okay? And I respect that because you're, I'm scared to give 1.2. But this patient at 200 over 100, and what was it, 120? Wow, that's hypertensive. Okay, she can probably handle it, no problem, and she did. <laughs> Once again, we get our IV, we get a uh, Decadron on board, which we're on the CHF side, so you kind of teeter back and forth there. We get uh, another dual nap. Okay, we're going to talk about it. So remember, that's two dual naps with a cardiac patient. Or we're buying off on the CHF side. Nitro pace, we get our Nalapur on board, and then way down the road here, so we started at 22, we're at 43, and we're finally moving to CPAP. The minute we move her over to CPAP, you saw blood pressure came down, Gases came down. We got gas exchange happening. And so it just takes time for that CPAP to work, but we waited a little bit longer until we got to that point. Okay? And as you can see, this is where we started. Uh, this is that right before we put her on CPAP. Yes, these are arguable. What does it look like? But you can see as soon as we get it on, we start perfusing. Yes, this only came up two points. But this dropped 10. That tells me that I'm forcing those fluids out. I'm forcing, I'm getting gas exchange of what I need at this point. And then the patient reports complete relief, the shortness of breath at the <clears> time. <throat> okay? But we waited 23 minutes before we got to this. Yes, I had drugs on board. So did the drugs fix it? Did the hydrose nitro, the nitro paste, the nalapril, did all that fix that? Could have. But we didn't see a lot of that until we got our CPAP in place. Any questions, comments on that? Just a few things I'll mention. So what are the negatives to use a CPAP? Like let's say we just all got a CPAP out and started putting them on. What's the, what can go wrong? Can crickets. Which it's, yeah, so ab about really the only negative thing that can happen is you can cause a pneumothorax. As far as I know, since we've done this, I have not had anything reported back that that's happened. But that is a theoretical risk. So, CPAP for everyone, you know, start it early. It's, there's not a lot of negative to it. You know, what's negative to intubation? We can, you know, there's a long list of that. There's not a lot of negatives to, oh, maybe I shouldn't have CPAP this guy. So what? You know, if you grab me one, I'll put one on right now. It's not going <coughs> to cause much negative stuff. So it can only help. And you know, we find some of these cases, it's one of those, the earlier the better, probably, you know, instead of medications and all this, I agree, it doesn't need done, but get that CPAP on first, then let's start working on all those medications. Okay, so I want to stress at the end, those two first cases, we had a prolonged CPAP, okay? Did that cause harm to our patient? Who knows, maybe so, maybe not, okay? But we show that to see how that improvement, or maybe I waited so long and good I had to take other means, or maybe the patient was teetering and I just kind of had to make that decision of what point do I go ahead and move them to CPAP. And you know the first one, or the second one, 97% within, within titles of 35, 
but you're documenting severe respiratory distress and you get 1.2 uh, nitro. So you kind of got to make those add up to where I'm trying to prevent the intubation at the end of the day. That's the goal, is to get them out of the hospital as soon as we can. So let's go over a quick CHF review. <coughs> Remember that as our CHF, this is uh, the ventricle. You can see it's getting big and fat. <coughs> the atrial still got quite a bit of room in it, but your ventricle doesn't. So this is filling this when this used to be a lot smaller than this was. So you can see that tissue. Remember, this is a cardiac-related issue at this point. Our ejection fracture is not where we need it. So they're not pumping, they're not filling, and they're not supplying blood like they need to. At the same time, it says, I don't have anywhere to go, so I'm going to back up into my lungs, I'm going to back up into my legs. Uh, typically, this is going to be your hypertension with your shortness of breath. Okay? Mm -hmm. Typically. I wish I could say every time, it's going to always be CHF because I'm hypertensive and respiratory distress. I can't. Because there's going to be those cases with COPD that are going to be hypertensive, that they're no pedophenia, they have lung sounds, or you know, they're wheezy, but they're not wet. So, you know, I wish there was a for sure, but there's not. So you just got to use an educated guess. The good thing is, <clears throat> use your oxygen in an appropriate device. Remember, our CPAP can be between 5 and 10 centimeters of water, okay? With caution at 10 centimeters of water, okay? We have yet, I have yet to see a documentation of anybody at 10 centimeters of water. Typically everybody's at 5 and 7 and a half, okay? Everybody can start at 5, and we can start that very quickly. Remember CPAP necessarily, we need to start it early, okay? That's why we have them in the airway bag. It may be where, I, well, I'm not for sure if we CHF or we COPD, but I know they can take CPAP. I can put my nitro on here in just a minute when we switch it over. When we switch over oxygen once we get in the truck, that's appropriate. But we can at least get them on CPAP. High dose nitro, 0.4 to 1.2. Remember, this is where we start vasodilating everything. This is where we reduce our pulmonary resistance. So it opens everything up and it allows that everything to flow a lot easier one way and backwards. Okay, back to the heart and from the heart. <clears throat> Remember our nitro pace. Yes, we do still maintain some vasodilatation. So we're going to get a little bit more vasodilatation from our nitro pace, but more than anything, we're going to maintain what my high dose nitro did. <clears throat> so it's going to keep them keep those vessels open. Then we move to our enalapril at 1.25 milligram slow IV push. This is our long acting drug. Remember, my body's going to start saying, hey, I need to do something because you've blown me open. I need to start dumping ACE on there. I need to start dumping my uh, ACE, uh, everything to start closing it back down. And this is where my ACE inhibitor comes in and puts a block over it and says, you're not going to close it off. I've blown it open for a reason. I'm going to keep it. And so I put a barrier there. And then last but not least, we have our duonil. <clears throat> now, we want to make sure that we limit this to one use on the heart side. Remember that adding that inotropium <clears throat> causes a lot of cardiac demand out of my heart. And <clears throat> during CHF, my heart may be already sick and I can't perform. If I don't have, it's like, uh, you know, I need an extra 400 pounds of foot torque to pull this trailer. But if my truck doesn't have that, I, I, don't, I can't give it to you. It's the same concept with my heart. If my heart's to this point and my heart's sick and it won't give me any more, I can't ask any more out of it. And that's what that onotropium does. Remember that with our duonavs, it's going to open our avular sacs. It's going to open our bronchioles. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're very specific here. We want to make sure that only our patients in CHF that have shark fin are getting uh, the duonavs. We're going to hear wheezes, okay? But is that wheezes caused from constriction or is it caused from fluid? Do I just need to blow it out of the way because I've got plenty of room in the lumen? And we're going to talk about that more on the COPD side. <coughs> I got real fancy. Kim was kind of joking about all my add-ins this time, so I was trying to get a little fancier. So we talk about our constriction. So we've got our bands down our bronchioles. So these start to squeeze down, okay? So that's causing my bronchioles to close. <clears throat> At that same time, I'm getting inflammation. Now guys, this is moving toward the COPD side. I'm starting to get my inflammation. Now, our CHFers can still have that inflammation. They can still have that irritation in there. But this is where I start to not only squeeze here, but now I'm starting to close my lumen in from swelling. 
Then I add my fluid on board. Not only are my avular sacs full, my bronchioles may be full, and they may be full of the, the thick mucousy stuff. And this is where we move to our CHF side. Not only, uh, not only do that, but now we have pulmonary resistance problem. Okay, so now my pulmonary side is starting to say, "Hey, I can't handle all this. I'm going to start squeezing." So then my heart starts working harder and has to pump against it, and that's why my heart demand is going up. This is going to equal severe respiratory distress. So how do we fix it? First of all, we get our high dose nitro. First and foremost, I want to blow these open. I want to blow everything open as high. <laughs> and as big as I can to give me as much room to work. Then I'm going to add my CPAP in. This is where I'm going to force my fluid, my junk, out of the way. So I'm going to get it. I've got to oh, blow it open. Now I'm going to start forcing it out. Did the nitro... We're just laughing about what you said. Oh. <laughs> then we've got our nitro paste on board. This is where we keep it open so long term my CPAP's able to work because I've got everything remaining open. Then we're going to add the enalapril to it. This is going to help us remain open. And then at the end of the day, we have better oxygenation and ventilation. Okay? There's two separate things here. I can always ventilate somebody. Okay? I'm always going to be able to put a BBM on Chris and I can always bag him. Okay? I may not, but I could. So I can always bag him, but that doesn't mean he's oxygenating. Okay? I've got to be able to get the oxygen where it needs to go. And part of that process is blowing this open. Come on. I agree. I, I would say you can't always ventilate somebody. <coughs> kind of massive spasm or well, foreign body. or. But I, I think you were talking about with CHF, typically you're probably not going to have a problem with ventilation. It's not always, you're not always able to oxygenate. Right. So the COPD side, this is where we start talking about our avular sacs are healthy. Uh, they look good. They are able to contract. They have the elasticity we need. <clears throat> this is where we start to produce our long, our sacs start to get very weak. They start to get elongated. They lose their elasticity at that point. So they're not able to squeeze that CO2 out and exchange it and get the oxygen in. Uh, this is the leading cause of COPD is your smokers. Okay? Ask that question, do you smoke? Okay? Do you have CHF, do you have COPD? Well, I have both. Okay? Well, are you still smoking? Yes. Okay. How's your blood pressure been? How's your legs look? Are your legs usually this big? And so this is where we have to start doing our investigation and figuring out what's going on. So not only on the CHF side do we get the constriction, we get the swelling, but then we get the thick mucus. We also get the old air trapped. And remember, COPD, I can get the air in, no problem. I have trouble getting that air back out. So that's where I'm going to be trapping and getting my, because my sacs are damaged. Uh, they're elongated. They're not doing what I need them to do. One of the biggest part is emphysema and chronic bronchitis also fall in this COPD family. Okay? Why well, have emphysema? What do you have COPD? No. Yeah, you do. I promise. It's all part of that same process. So some of our drug of choice for COPD. This is where we get our oxygen. Remember, these patients don't need any more than five centimeters of water. Okay? We thought we were going to be able to use, go down to 2.5 on some of these with the new CPAP device. It won't, it won't sustain. Okay? It just won't create enough pressure to keep it that low. That takes a machine or a ventilator in order to do that. So at 5 centimeters of water is where we need to be. Once again, if they're short of breath and they're only able to speak two or three word sentences, I need to move to CPAP directly. I need to be there very quickly to get there. Also on the Duonab, the inotropium. Guys, you can give unlimited doses of Duonab by the protocol. Okay? These patients, it's not a cardiac issue. The inotropium is not, it is asking more out of the heart, yes. But my heart is not sick. It's my lungs that are sick at this point. So I can ask more out of it if I need it. Um, use your intel on your waveform. Am I starting to see improvements? Okay? Guys, I'm probably not going to see improvements in the shark fin. But I may see improvements in my numbers. Okay? It may take hours or even days to correct the constriction portion with other medications, long-term steroids. And this is where we also add our Decadron in. This allows for that lumen space to start not only being opened up by the constriction, but the lumen inside to start unswelling from where it's inflamed in there. 
Uh, typically, remember, Decadron works between about 30 minutes and an hour. It's the quickest acting steroid, but it doesn't hang around a long time. A lot of times, these patients, they're going to follow them up at the hospital with a more long-term acting steroid. So let's talk about some cases. <coughs> 97 blank responded uh, to the block of this for category 6. They found a 76-year-old sitting with severe respiratory distress with one to two word sentences. Um, patient has a history of COPD. They're starting to lay that grounds out. Uh, and it's happened 30 minutes prior to arrival. What's our benefit here? It just started. Okay? We're not on that third or fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh day where we're already behind the eight ball. <coughs> Sorry. Hypertension, COPD, they don't say anything about uh, CHF at this point. The patient's uh, found conscious, alert, and oriented with audible strider, uh, respiratory distress at 32 times per minute, uh, strong, rapid, irregular pulses noted. <coughs> We work very quickly. Uh, they get the patient on CPAP, starts responding to CPAP within about about 13 minutes here. They, now this CPAP's already in place and I'll show you times here in just a minute. But they already start seeing improvement. They put the CPAP on in the house and we're already starting to make that progress. Even though I don't have any drugs on board right now because I'm just forcing the bare minimum things, whether it be the dual nav or just oxygen, down to where we need it. Um, the patient uh, still remains calm, is uh, a lot easier breathing, respiratory has dropped down to 22, uh, we're starting to make improvement. They did a really good job getting end titles on very quickly, once again 27, okay? But it's 78% sat, so what does that tell me? I've got gas exchange, I'm just not oxygenating very well, okay? I'm not getting the oxygen where I need it to go. Sorry, a little bit of hypertension, moderate, so you could kind of weigh that as CHF, COPD side. Uh, then we move into our SATs, begin to improve. We go from 78 to 86. End titles pretty much remain the same. <clears throat> Here they did document, and I'll just show you, because guys, once again, documentation on room air SAT was 56%. Okay, did I see that up here? Do that to a prior to arrival or on arrival. Guys, you don't necessarily always have to have a, a blood pressure in there. Maybe, here's what I found when I first walked in. The stats were low. We worked on getting CPAP on. We didn't necessarily have a blood pressure quite yet. Okay, that's appropriate to have that because this is a very important number, 56. And then once we got them on oxygen, we went to 78. But then it still told me I needed to go to CPAP quickly. So as you can see, they got them on the cardiac monitor. They had them on CPAP within six minutes of inside the house. Um, once again, they started the dual nab. They have the IV. They did their 12 leads in place. They got their decadron on board uh, a little ways down, which is appropriate. They gave another dual nab and another follow-up 12 lead. Okay? They did an extraordinary job of doing serial 12 leads with giving drugs that are asking a lot out of the heart at that time. Um, they did go 31 and 3 to the hospital, um, into Covenant, and everything went very well. Any comments on that? Yeah, can we go back to the first slide? Please? So what was wrong with this patient? <coughs> what do you think is wrong with this patient? Still be so you'll be the exacerbation. So what other med are they taking right there? No, pro No. Right to the right. Is that an allergy or the other med that they're taking? Right there. This is a med. Above it. Oh, that's an allergy. Okay. Doxycycline. Okay. I was going to say, are they taking doxycycline? No. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's why I was wondering. Okay. Just make you think, what if they're septic? What if they're, uh, you know, they're taking, you know, they're taking uh, antibiotics because they've been sick? Could be. I think this case shows great, you know, <coughs> patient, I don't, it didn't sound like completely turned around. We made some progress. <coughs> but I also think this is somebody, had we not got that early CPAP, would they have been intubated by the time we get, or, you know, before our care was done, or potentially at the hospital, 
So we could already see that improvement happening. And that's because we got the CPAP on early. Now, the room air sat at 56. How long are they going to sustain it? Not long. <coughs> you know, in the 80s, they could probably tolerate it for a little while because they lived there most of the time. Okay, a lot of those COPD years, they live like that. <coughs> All right, case two. They're already calling it CHF right off the get go. Call the respiratory distress. Uh, patient began her problems on uh, 7 14. You're not going to see any other dates. Just FYI, I left that in there so you could know that's about two or three days down the road now from when we, we so they've been progressively getting worse over two to three days. <coughs> they've had a history of bypass, so you know they got some cardiac issue. <coughs> Uh, probably not the strongest heart in the world, but they may also have possibly CHF and COPD. So what's going to be our indicator of is it COPD or is it CHF? We're going to start sizing them up. We're going to use their blood pressure. We're going to use, uh, do we have any edema? What do our lungs sound like? Are we wet? Are we uh, wheezing? Are we just coarse? So they document very well SATs of 50, 65 to 70. They're speaking in two to three word sentences. This is at 29. Um, at this time, and I'll show you here in a minute, they already have CPAP on, and we're 14 minutes down the road, and SATs are at 93 to 97%. So we're doing very well. CPAP continues, and now we're up to 99. So our times, once again, here's a great documentation of it. You don't always have to have, guys, this may be a little bit incomplete. If you'll notice, most of the vital signs here are not complete. Okay? We see this a lot. And it's important for us to know where did we start and where do we, get, where do we head to. But we did get them... Sorry. 48 in labor, 70. We moved, yes, it took us a little while, about 20 minutes to get in title on. So I don't totally know... What fully went on in that these first little bit, but I can show you that we were hypertensive, 200 over 118, 204 over 126. This is auscultated and then NIVP, so we know we're pretty close to each other. <clears throat> we get CPAP on at 35, so that's pretty quick, about seven or eight minutes into this. We already had CPAP in place. Then we got a dual nav on there. Now, we're kind of going with the COPD, and it's okay. Um, I'm sorry, we're going with the CHF side. We get nitro paste. We don't see nitro in here. When I talked to the crew, they were talking about, we just, when we switched them over, we never got to the nitro. We never took time to pull that off. They had an old CPAP. You guys, y'all remember the older CPAP models? They were kind of hard to get the, the pill in. With the newer one, remember when we switch them off, you can pop it right off and slide that right in. Okay, so it, it it can be done. It may not be done till later on. That's fine. Get them on CPAP. We can blow them open with the nitro blister here shortly. But they do get the nitro paste on. They do get their IV. They get a 12 lead. Then they get their enalapril on board. Um, But you can see the progression. Sorry, guys. 70, all the way up to 93. And see, this is just right. CPAP came in about 30, what do we say, 30? 36. 36, so five minutes in. It's not a quick turnaround, but we start to make progress. And then you can see as we come down, we're making progress. Now, we're adding drugs to this regimen. We're adding the things that they need to blow open. But at the main portion, you can see an immediate... <coughs> reverse of that patient using the CPAP device. <coughs> yeah, I think this was a great case. Just shows how the CHF protocol works. Where you can follow those numbers and see where our oxygenation went, uh, our blood pressure went the right direction, the patient was doing better. You know, this is one you show up and I'm in the ER, I'm like, why did y'all bring this guy? There's nothing wrong with him. It's like, no, no, you should have seen him 20 minutes ago. He looked terrible, but y'all fixed him. <laughs> You know, it's essentially me call somebody and send him upstairs for admission. There's not much left for me to do to him. But you don't mind? No, that's great. The more we do pre-hospital, the better. You kind of wonder if we would have got high-dose nitro on, 
where would we have been? It took us. It did take a little bit for them to start turning around and start to oxygenate. <clears throat> but where would we have been if we could have added a little bit of high dose nitroglycerin to it? Okay. Maybe. <coughs> what would somebody? How how comfortable would you be at 200 over 118? Down in pulses. How much nitro? 1.2. Okay. So how much? 1.2. 1.2. I would be very comfortable going 0.2. Guys, but a lot of times we're seeing rarely if people give them the full dose of one two, okay? And we respect that because we're everybody's still trying to get used to this giving a large dose of that, okay? And what it does to our blood pressure and all. Well, my question from y'all that review a lot of the charts, I mean, how many are we seeing the blood pressure just tanking? I've yet to see I mean, I won't say it doesn't happen. It happens, but it doesn't very often. You know, you give nitro a lot for the chest pains, and, and that you'll see somebody's pressure will fall, but it was probably... You know, 130 over 80, and it falls. But usually, these folks that are really high, uh, they just don't fall. I can't really explain why, but they just don't. I don't think we've had a case yet, but like Chad said, we also been we pretty don't conservative. Use that bigger dose, but yeah, we've been pretty conservative with giving the the nitro. Right. I mean, I've seen very few of these that got 1.2. We had a couple of COPD years that we started out <clears throat> five. One of them accidentally got to seven and a half, and they did. They did drop the pressure pretty quick, but that's from the interthoracic pressure to put too much pressure on the inferior superior meta cava, so they're going to hyper and that's going to happen. I don't think we need to push that we leave here. Okay, now everybody's getting three nitros yeah. from here on out. We don't want to necessarily swing that direction. I, I think the big overarching intent of this case review is that early CPAP. You know, again, we've talked about what's negatives. There's the possibility you get three, three nitros, you drop your pressure. A CPAP. There's not many negatives. <coughs> All right, case three. This is the last case. <coughs> so we've got severe respiratory distress, LFRs on scene. Um, they get there. The patient was awoken about an hour ago, so that tells me I'm not very far into this. I've got a chance to make a big difference quickly. The patient has a history of, once again, COPD, CHF. Uh, patient is requesting transfer <coughs> EMC. Okay, this is the report of the month. As you can see, all through the report, I have met, this is the first time I've ever seen this much detail in drugs. I was very, very impressed here. Uh, got the doses, got them down. How often? I mean, very, very impressive. I, I would venture to say a lot of nurses in the emergency room don't document this this well. Right. Is that fair? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's amazing how, and, and I, don't, I don't document this in, in detail, but it's very important. But you talk about, they talk about their, their past CHF history, exactly what went on, uh, how long it's been going. Talked about uh, behavior disorder, their anxiety, what's causing what. <clears throat> we get into, uh, so EMS, uh, these conscious alert and oriented, severe respiratory distress. They obtained their history. Uh, patient severely diaphoretic. Um, her blouse is noted to be saturated. Great documentation talking about labored breathing. Okay, multiple times coached patients to slow down, uh, unable to do so, severe shortness of breath. Talking about a fluid bolus and why uh, less than a thousand uh, patients severely diaphoretic with uh, some uh, saturations of the clothes. No active bleeding. Talk about uh, any loss. Uh, they just talked about that it was less than a, a thousand liters because she was so diaphoretic. Uh, went through and talked about, uh, they did great uh, early CPAP on this patient. They talked about, um, once again, the progression. So now here's what I'm hearing in the upper and lower lobes again. Uh, they described some of it up here, but really broke it down here as we begin to progress. Uh, patients noted, to have her eyes closed and does not respond to vulgar stimuli. Uh, patient and guys, it's going to happen. You're going to start them on CPAP and sometimes they're still going to continue to go downhill. They're so far into that process. There's nothing you can do about it. That's where that LOC comes into play. <clears throat> now this crew just happened to be very close to the hospital. By the time they got here, uh, they had the CPAP at 5. We'll talk about that more. 168 over 102. Where do you feel comfortable giving them nitro out if you were going to give them that for that blood pressure? Maybe two. I, I'd probably go 0.8 on that one, you know. 
that's kind of that borderline of getting really hypertensive, but I would be comfortable at two on her. Um, very detailed talking about the respiratory distress at this time, talking about what they're hearing. Uh, early, once again, very early uh, in titles. And guys, it may be that point of I get on that severe respiratory or that cardiac, I need to take my heart monitor in the house. This is something that, that we don't do regularly. But it may be, if I've got to get on a Category 10, I need to take my monitor in. Especially if I'm going to be going up to the apartment complex upstairs. Or I'm going to be you know, going up to the 10th floor of, uh, you know, of an apartment complex. I need to make sure that I'm taking the gear that I need in. You don't go without your airway bag. Well, maybe it might mean I need to have my uh, heart monitor. I need to have my end titles available very quickly. They get oxygen, they do an ab, uh, they get C once again CPAP very early, about minute eight. They've already got them on CPAP at five um, and talked about the mask fitting with no complications noted. Once again, did a 12 lead and did a very nice job uh, talking about the 12 lead. The 12 lead looked horrible. <coughs> they talked about it. Patients in severe respiratory stress were unable to calm the patient, could not get a good 12 lead. They did the nitro paste in place. Uh, once again, did not get the PO nitro, okay? I understand sometimes, you know, they're, they're just trying to get that CPAP and get them blown open quickly. But they got, they got the nitro paste and start to, build, start to get some basal dilatation out of that. They get their IV in place. And then you can see very detailed of everything that was done, why they did what they did. Sublingual nitro was not given uh, to prevent removing the CPAP mask. Just tell me why. If there, there's going to be breaches in protocol, <coughs> just tell me why. Tell me why. Say if the heart monitor didn't upload. Tell me why. Explain it, and that's what keeps us from getting getting in trouble for in case we ever do come back on legal, we ever have an issue, doctors ask questions. Uh, guys, you'd be surprised how many reports we'll get, and those people call and say, the doctor said I need to see the strips. I didn't want them to attach to the report. Well, I don't know why it wasn't. I can't tell you why, because nothing was documented in the report. Tell us why these things don't happen. <clears throat> he was very, uh, uh, was very thorough in talking about why they didn't do sublingual nitro. So very thorough with this report. 